Hello, everyone. My name is Marcy Canciobello, and it is my great honor on behalf of Books and Books and Miami Book Fair to welcome you to tonight's special event, celebrating the National Poetry Series, featuring an evening with Robert Haas, Tracy K. Smith, and Natasha Trethaway, moderated by Daniel Halpern. Um, just one housekeeping note is that there is a green button at the bottom of your screen, and if you click on that link at any point throughout the evening or even after this event, uh, you can purchase any of their books through Books and Books, supporting local independent bookstores. Uh, and you can also donate to the National Poetry Series here. And you'll learn a little bit more about that as we go through the evening. I will also be disabling the chat for the duration of the event so that we can focus on the, the poetry and the conversation that's going to happen. But I will be re-enabling it at the end of the event. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Daniel Halpern, tonight's moderator. He's the founder of Echo and the author of nine collections of poetry, most recently, Something Shining. For 25 years, he edited the international literary magazine Antaeus, which he started in Tangier with Paul Bowles. He has received various awards, including the first editor's award given by poets and writers and the 2015 Maxwell Perkins Award. And in 1978, with James Mishner, he began the National Poetry Series. Please give a round of virtual applause to Daniel Halpern. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Books and Books. Thanks, all of you, for being here. Um, the National Poetry Series began in 1978 with James Mitchner. The first book to win this prize was not a first book of poems. It was the last book. It was the collected poems of Sterling Brown, whose work was no longer in print, selected by the poet Michael Harper. Brown was a contemporary of Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, and Marianne Moore, and taught, among others, Lucille Clifton and Toni Morrison. Maya Angelou wrote Sterling Brown, of Sterling Brown, his poetry could only have been shaped by a black American throat. His poems have the power of revival music, the declaration of great oratory and the sonorous crooning of a young man in love. I didn't know 40 years ago that first book would signify what NPS would become, an organization with a single goal to publish books of poetry and begin careers and celebrate a lifetime achievement. We've now seen into print over 200 books. May I suggest when this program is over that you Google one of his poems called Southern Cop about a young black man shot by a cop written over 80 years ago, a poem that unfortunately could have been written tomorrow. The three poets reading tonight need no introduction. They've all been US Poet Laureates and have each won most of the important prizes given to poets. I hope you'll buy a copy of their most recent work and I hope you'll consider making a contribution to the National Poetry Series. It has not been a year for fundraising. In order, Tracy K. Smith will read first most recent book of poems is Wade in the Water, her memoir, a book written in the memory of her mother, of the South, and of herself, Ordinary Light, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Robert Hass's most recent book of poems is Summer Snow, and he wrote a little book on form, an exploration into the formal imagination of poetry. His deep commitment to the environment, to environmental issues, led him to found River of Words, an organization that promotes environmental and arts education. Natasha Trethaway also published a remarkable memoir about her mother, about the South, and about herself, entitled Memorial Drive. And her most recent collection of poetry is Monument a new and selected poems. So Tracy will begin with the reading. 
Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm so excited to be here um, with such wonderful uh, poets whose careers have really taught me what it means to be a poet and what it means to build a sense of conscience and community um, through poetry and through engagement with communities. Um, so I will read a few poems, um, mostly new work, um, work to come out of this fraught year, but I thought I would start with an older poem called Declaration, which is an erasure of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and I'll do that mostly because what I find that I'm thinking about um, so consistently through my, my books is America, but from different vantage points. Um, Wade in the Water is really rooted in some ways in history and I think the poems that have emerged for me out of um, the past year are um, thinking about how history seems to weigh upon us and what it feels like um, to think about America from on the ground, underfoot in some ways, which is a state of consternation. Declaration. He has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. He has plundered our, ravaged our, destroyed the lives of our, taking away our, abolishing our most valuable and altering fundamentally the forms of our in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here, taken captive, on the high seas to bear I um I've said so many times but I really believe it's true that sometimes listening to these documents that we consider to be our founding documents these living texts is um kind of a form of conversation um, and sometimes what has been startling or chastening is um, what a text like the Declaration of Independence seems to understand about um, the American predicament that maybe uh, we as a nation have been unwilling to accept or, or articulate. Um, I think of the poems I'm writing um, as attempts at conversation. Um, Obviously, there's the unconscious mind of, of the poet that is engaged in the creation of any poem. But I, I find that I'm also yearning toward a sense of dialogue with um, what I would imagine to be community, ancestry, um, and others who feel themselves to be committed to a kind of work of, of possibility making and of justice. Uh, this is a poem called Be on a Sill. B as in the insect, B on a sill. Submits to its own weight, the bulb of itself too full, too weak or too wise to lift and go. And something blunt in me remembers the old charade about putting a thing out of its misery. For it, for me, Sleep be deep and easy. Hive, heave, give, grieve. Then rise when you're ready from your soul's hard floor to sweet work or some war. Um, this is a poem called, We Feel Now a Largeness Coming On. Being called all manner of things from the dictionary of shame, not English, 
not words, not heard, but worn, born, carried, never spent. We feel now a largeness coming on, something passing into us. We know not in what source it was begun, but wrapped, we watch it rise through our fallen, our slain, our millions dragged, chained. Like daylight setting leaves alight, green to gold to blinding white, like a spirit caught, flame in flesh. I watched a woman try to shake it once from her shoulders and hips, a wild, annihilating fright. Other women formed a wall around her, holding back what clamored to rise. God, devil, ancestor, what black bodies carry through your schools, your cities. Do you see how mighty you've made us all these generations running? Every day, stealing ourselves against it. Every day, coaxing it back into coils. And all the while, feeding it and all the while loving it. Um, I think that um, this past, particularly the summer of 2020, um, the world and the world that felt close at hand just seemed uh, insurmountable, um, so full of loss, of violence, of refusal, of um, grief and fear. Um, and poems seemed to just kind of help me get through that time. And so much so that there were poems that I sat down to write. And then other times I would get up and start to read the newspaper and say, oh, my God, this article seems like it's speaking to me. Um, that's the case with the poem I'm about to read. Uh, it's derived from an article about um, elephants in, um, I think, Tanzania, who are dying at an alarming rate of an unknown affliction. Um, but reading it when I did, um, it spoke to me so much of the, you know, the epidemic of uh, violence against, against unarmed black citizens that we are still um, in the middle of. Um, so this is called The Elephant in the Poem. And there's some blank spaces in several sentences um, where something has been omitted. And I'll just mark a little extra space there. The elephant in the poem. Some appeared to have died suddenly, collapsing chest first while walking or running. Experts are left with few clues as to whether the cause is something sinister, such as, or a naturally occurring disease from which the areas will bounce back. As populations grow, it is more likely that you will get mass die-offs, probably on a bigger scale than this. Death comes to all living things. The important thing now is to identify what is causing the deaths. Researchers observed some that appeared disoriented, including one that was walking in circles. Others were dragging their legs as though paralyzed, and still others appeared lethargic and emaciated. Males and females, young and old, all seem equally affected. Many still consider the country a safe haven for at this point, the deaths do not constitute a crisis. Um, one of my dear friends um, lost her mother this past summer. And, um, you know, there are so many of us who are in that awful club of, of motherless people. And so I was thinking about 
our mothers somehow on the other side, perhaps knowing one another. And then the diameter of that thought kind of grew a little bit. And I was thinking, well, there are so many mothers who in life would have nothing to do with one another because of distance or difference, um, who might also now know one another. And so this poem was born, it's called Mothership. You cannot see the mothership in space, it and she being made of the same thing. All our mothers hover there in the ceaseless blue-black, watching it ripple and dim to the prized pale blue in which we spin, we who are black and you too. Our mothers know each other there, fully and finally. They see what some here see and call anomaly, the way the sight of me might set off a shiver in another mother's son, a deadly silent digging in, a stolid refusal to budge, the viral urge to stake out what on solid ground is authority, and sometimes also territory. Our mothers, knowing better, call it folly. Dock of the Bay. Um, I'll just say, you know, the bee poem and this poem kind of emerge out of just despair, <laughs> honest despair. I think I'm not alone. Um, earlier, Robert was talking about an article on languishing as a medical condition that many of us are experiencing. Um, and so this is a poem that is really just thinking about how hard it is to keep going and how hard it is to feel um, a sense of battle um, in the air, in the space, um, in a way that, um, that feels so historical and so unrelenting. Dock of the Bay. Oh, Otis, for so long I did not know what you knew and sang of sweetly as if it were not piquant and heavy and bleak. Fridays, my father crooned along, glass of amber and ice in hand. I thought it was about ease, the end of the week, not the white world snarling through its teeth. Look like nothing's gonna change. Everything still remains the same. No, Otis, we are not lazy. We are not even particularly angry. But look how we strain beneath steady weather. Morning sun, evening come. Otis, brother, the long line of us shoulder to shoulder under what will not go quietly into the ground. And I'll close with um, a poem called Rapture that um, has an epigraph from an interview with filmmaker Arthur Jaffa. Um, one of his most uh, well-known films is a short film called Love is the Message, The Message is Death. After you look up that Sterling Brown poem, you should uh, watch that uh, film online. Um, in talking about it, um, he said, and it's a film that has a lot of the kinds of video uh, clips that we've now come to think of as evidence um, along with other clips from um, news footage and, and historical um, moments in America, um, glimpses of black life, black joy, um, and tremendous grief. Um, and he said of that film, and on a simpler level, I want you to look up at these things that are happening to black people, not down the way you would stare at the sun. This is called rapture. It was a stirring and a rising like vapor, 
a gathering up and a lifting off. And then it was a swarm, all the many coalescing as a form unified in its going. Where? Like I said, up and off, a rapture. Sometimes the light reversed course, reaching into me, a bright resonance, a flood spilling down. But soon it whirled, spun around, lifting over the trees, over the scraped stone tops of mountains to disappear through a ring of sky. I saw the shape of a woman in a wide cotton dress, lying broken or sleeping or spent, lifted skyward into the distance and disappearing, dangling a foot in the black wake of history. Thank you so much. Should I just begin? I guess I should just begin. What a pleasure to be reading with Tracy and Natasha. I, I don't know if you all heard when she was talking about the poem about mothers on the other side. She said that she was thinking about it, the diameter of the thought uh, expanded. It's that, that, that's enough for me for the afternoon, that phrase. Thank you, Tracy, so much. I have, um, over this last year, acquired a, a kind of a mess of uncompleted or fin not finally resolved poems. I'm just going to read for a bit. So a lot of mornings spent walking. Uh, these are November haiku or November attempts at a haiku. Quack, 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 says the crow. It's morning. Quack, quack, quack. Or maybe better. November, icy air, quack, quack, quack. Or maybe November morning, some crows caw, some croak. The sycamores on the street, the way the tree's nervous system shuts off nourishment to the leaves, according to a signal from the leaves. There have been three consecutive icy mornings and the trees begin to look half bare. So the haiku might go, just a few leaves less, the sycamore says. The sycamore says, I think I'm getting sleepy. What do they have in common? Crows on a telephone wire, the blue sky, my neighbor's turquoise trimmed windows, the cracks in the road of our seismically uneasy street. That they exist is what they have in common. Their being saturates them like sunlight, rains on them like rain. Sky, clouds, they look this morning like rumpled sheets. Someone invented the word rumple for that look. Think, in less than a second, the ear and the brain distinguished a slight difference in the sound made by the minuscule difference in the placement of the lips by someone who says rumple and someone who says rumble. Puh, bah. It would be a different matter if the sky rumbled. And even early on a December morning in the cold, when it feels entirely good luck to be awake at all, it is very pleasant to think of the rumpled look of the white down comforter strewn across a bed cold wind, a sky of raked clouds. On the morning toward the middle of December, the slant light hasn't reached the street yet. One scrub jay up in the sunlight on a telephone wire, warming its breast. My neighbors have begun the holiday decorations, Christmas lights on a rosemary hood, ornaments on the branches of an ironwood tree. December 21st. The undersides of clouds just at dusk a smoky rose. We stopped on the roadside and walked uphill to a meadow as the dark came on. 
streaky sky, the moon visible, lambent behind clouds, and just above the ridge, the twin lights, Saturn overriding Jupiter, becoming one small bright gleam, the cold coming up with the dark, up the hill, beyond the shouts of a few people, seeing this strange light, come to witness there was a cow lowing somewhere in the meadow. There's more of that, they sort of endless amounts of that actually. So uh, a lot of time spent looking out of windows. This is levitation. A hummingbird lights on a woody stem of the cantula, perches there stilled and looks around. An anus, the feathers on its neck catching the light as it moves its head in the jerky motion of movie dinosaurs and tilts its beak toward the sky, the gesture of humans who think well of themselves. Though the bird might be thinking about ants or small spiders, or maybe it's just taking the air. It's late June, the morning has been foggy, marine mist blowing in from the Pacific in billowing gusts. So it's only now in the early e evening that the fog has burned off and the summer air settled in. Maybe the bird is watching whatever interests it in the way that I am watching the bird. The flowers of the catcher withered weeks ago. The cascade of scarlet trumpets that seem to have been made for hummingbirds, which means they were made by hummingbirds, dangle down in small shriveled clusters. The white flowers of the climbing rose have also withered. Floribunda, the creamy blossoms so abundant on the trellis, I didn't like to cut bunches of them to take inside, though I knew, of course, that they die one way or the other, in the house or on the vine. The hydrangea has only just begun to blossom. On the other hand, the clusters of their flowers, a white tin faintly with pale green, also the fuchsia with its slim, graceful, pale pink flowers is just beginning to bloom. There are clocks in seeds, the one that turned off the catchua and the one that turned on the hydrangea and the hummingbird's heart is a clock and mine too. When I looked up to read from registering this fact, the bird was gone, probably working the nectar in the fuchsias, wings beating so rapidly they almost seem not to be there. Trying to get a hold, little hold, of the politics of this time. It's a poem from just before called Writing in Hotels. I checked in thinking I would write about Iran we try to describe in plain language and functional semi-verse like this, how the United States in 1953 collaborated with British intelligence to overthrow the democratically elected government of Iran because it had nationalized British petroleum and diverted millions of petrodollars that had been flowing into London into the treasury of the country that actually possessed the oil. So the British and the Americans installed Rezi Pavlavi of the royal family in the government to restore the revenues to Great Britain and the United States in return for which Pavlavi got the royal phone and special funds with which to train a secret police in the CIA's methods of enhanced interrogation. And then I thought, no, give it a rest. Write about the gosling, the fuzzy little creature on the beach that tried and failed to jump over a low cement wall that separated the beach from the picnic tables, which her mother had jumped over easily in order to reconnoiter the crumbs of our evening meal. The gosling made a little keen noise in her throat and the mother goose reluctantly leaped back over the wall and made her way down the sand toward the lapping water and the gosling scurried into place behind her. And then I thought, no, I've seen, as everyone in the world has seen, the photograph of the body of Oscar Alberto Romero Martinez and the 
body of his daughter, Angela Valeria, faces down, bound to each other by the 25-year-old father's black t-shirt, drowned trying to swim across the Rio Grande. The child's mother, feeling the swiftness of the current, had turned back and I thought, no, maybe something about entering the ice-cold mountain lake for the startling and entirely voluntary pleasure of Congress with Sierra snowpack on a sunny day when Oscar Romero was waiting with his daughter on his back in the Rio Grande and no notice somehow, I took notice somehow that Oscar Romero bore the name of the Salvadoran bishop who having spoken out against the military hunter that ran his impoverished country was assassinated on the altar of his church while he was saying mass, shot with a high powered rifle supplied by the military, paid for by the United States Congress, whose policy it was to make sure that high minded priests and their left wing leaders of teachers unions and farmers workers unions did not get a hold on power. I was working on how to phrase this last, did not pitch the country into a Cuban camp give godless communism a foothold in Central America, something like that, when there was a knock on the door and the young Mexican girl who cleans my room and makes the bed and replaces the soft white towels and vacuums the floor and cleans the surface in the little kitchen area and empties the coffee grounds and cleans the toilet and folds the end of the toilet paper roll into a neat V like the formation of the Canada geese at the lake flying in when they are migrating south in the early fall, asked if I was ready to have my room serviced. And I said to her, thank you, but, but no, I am still working. And she said she was very sorry to disturb me and that she would be back later. So this is a, uh, from a series of poems called Of the Soul. This is actually the third poem of the soul. Maybe I should read the first one. I can find it quickly. Yeah. Of the soul. Trees reach for the light, but hunger down into the dark that sustains them. All afternoon, the fog has been blowing in and the sycamore with its large raggedy leaves has been shivering in the wind, waving in the wind. They're alive, of course, living beings. But it's the time when you sense they're alive. And like all plants, they are blind. Well, not blind. That is a word, and they don't need words, contrived by one of the sighted animals, more accurate to say that they don't have eyes. Like all plants that share the earth with us, they don't need eyes. Cells in the sunward faces of the leaves drink sunlight like a liquid sugar. The fibrous nerves in the tree's roots burrow down and breathe in water, chelate minerals from the stony dark. We invented that word chelate because it's not exactly eating that they do, though we want every kind of creature life to tell us about ours blind, reaching for light, gripping down into stone on a summer night, shivering in seamless, shuddering and dancing in the sea wind. And we don't mind if the analogy is not exactly true, if it's beautiful. So this is a poem about the soul. Gosh, what to do. Um, This is politics. So how do you not go to sleep thinking of the children without their parents living in filth at the border and wake thinking of them? And a poem you might want to write. In the bad lip sync of the dubbed video of Ta Costa Gravis' Z, you stop being driven crazy only when Yves Montan is killed and Irene Pappas, who plays his wife, stops talking. A man who lives in a country run by a military hunter, the story goes, walks across the square to give a speech against the hunter. The generals can't kill him themselves. There's the question of NATO, of US foreign aid. 
This was years before the Saudi prince sent a squad of murderers and a surgeon to torture and kill the journalist he didn't like and dismember his body and pack it in a suitcase and bring it home. Here, four thugs drive up in a comically small white car and turn into the square. The white citrion, whatever it was, is fate. Two men surge from the car with bats and crush his skull and in the room ensuing panic in the crowd with police collusion, return to the car and drive off as if they were never there. Here we leave the politics behind. His wife with a ravaged face receives the news in her hotel room. Her husband is dead. She sits in the dark for a long time with no expression on her face. Finally, she gets up, goes to the bathroom, turns on the faucet, splashes water on her cheeks, her eyes, and then, without expression, pauses, turns the water off, and reaches for his aftershave. She's looking at herself, at her eyes in the mirror, and she untwists the cap and smells the lotion. The rest of the film is politics. An investigator is appointed who is expected to protect the generals, but doesn't. He finds the killers, this is what makes the story an entertaining procedural, names their bosses in the purely professional sense of justice he's been educated to. So the generals kill him too and bury the story. And the audience of middle class urban intellectuals who watch things like Costa Grava's films is left with an aching hunger for justice and the memory of a woman before a mirror sniffing a bottle of her dead husband's aftershave. Um, finish with um, what, what is kind of um, well. I don't. I think I don't need to explain it. It's called the Government Lake. It was dark, and I could hear the cicada out the window. Where there's a lawn, several very large pine trees, and a pond. And the cicada was going like crazy, de rip, de rip, sometimes de rip a rip, but in no particular sequence, mostly it was de rip, de rip, but piercing. As in the poem by Basho that goes something like deep stillness, the voice of the cicada drills into the rocks. I was feeling restless anyway, so I went out into the dark and lay down on the lawn was wet and cold and found myself looking right into the eyes of a cicada that just kept at it, de rip, de rip, apparently indifferent to my presence. I said to it, trying to sound uh, sociable without sounding needy, you know that the poet Jim Tate died and the cicada said, can't you see that I'm trying to attract a mate? Would you please get the hell out of here? And I said, I will hurt. I thought you'd like to know. The cicada said, you could almost hear it sign or the circadian equivalent. Was he a friend of yours or something? And I said, more a companion spirit than a friend. We're both poets. We crossed paths occasionally over the years. I admired his work. I think he liked me. Do you feel like you work beside other cicadas you respect? And he said, beginning to be interested in the conversation. Of course not. We compete relentlessly. What do you think I'm doing out here in the dark? There must be some other cicadas whose style you admire, I said. You must, uh, you know, think that dude is pretty good. Zakata said, we would never call each other dude. That's totally a human thing. And I need to get back to singing. You're getting into my kitchen here. Well, I can go back inside. I have a book of Jim Tate's poems that was published after he died. They're prose poems, mostly kind of odd little stories. Can you track the mate with prose poems? The cicada asked. I said, probably not. Well, that's why I'm committed to the lyric. So anyway, I'm going to make a joke, okay? Bug off. And I said, well, let me just quote to you this one Japanese poem, okay? It's pretty famous. It goes, you'd never know from the cicada's cry that it was going to die. I went back to my room where all you could hear outside in the dark was derip, derip. But I was 
pretty used to it, and I picked up the book of Jim Tate's last poems. It's called The Government Lake, and I began to read it. So thank you. Thanks very much. Wow, it's so lovely and heartening and moving to be here with Tracy and Bob and to feel so seen by their poems. And thank you all for tuning in. When I was 19, not long after my mother died, I tried to write a first poem as an adult more a girl child on the cusp of whatever comes next as a motherless daughter to contend with my grief. And so I began my writing life in an elegiac mood. But I also write to contend with our shared and difficult history as Americans and to push back against received knowledge across time and space. I think those two impulses join in this poem. It took me over 30 years after her death to write it, a poem that pushes back against all the misconceptions I've heard over the years. Imperatives for carrying on in the aftermath. Do not hang your head or clench your fists when even your friend after hearing the story says my mother would never put up with that fight the urge to rattle off statistics that more often a woman who chooses to leave is then murdered the hundredth time your father says but she hated violets why would she marry a guy like that don't waste your breath explaining again how abusers wait, are patient, that they don't beat you on the first date, sometimes not even the first few years of a marriage. Keep an impassive face whenever you hear, stand by your man, and let go your rage when you recall those words or advice given your mother. Try to forget the first trial before she was dead, when the charge was only attempted murder. Don't belabor the thinking or the sentence that allowed her ex-husband's release a year later, or the juror who said, it's a domestic issue. They should work it out themselves. Just breathe when, after you read your poems about grief, a woman asks, do you think your mother was weak for men? Learn to ignore subtext. Imagine a thought cloud above your head, dark and heavy with the words you cannot say. Let silence rain down. Remember you were told by your famous professor that you should write about something else, unburden yourself of the death of your mother and just pour your heart out in the poems. Ask yourself what's in your heart, that reliquary blood locket and seed bed and contend with what it means, the folk saying you learned from a Korean poet in Seoul, that one does not bury the mother's body in the ground, but in the chest, or like you, you carry her corpse on your back. Yesterday was my birthday, and in a few states, Confederate Memorial Day. 
I was born exactly a hundred years to the day it was first celebrated in Mississippi as a holiday glorifying the lost cause, white supremacy, the attempt to maintain slavery, and its ongoing unjust aftermath. I think it would have been impossible for me to grow up without the need to contend with the history of the place that rendered me illegitimate in the eyes of the law, persona non grata. Back then, I was illegal. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. Among many other things this past year, I've been thinking a lot about all of the trumped up fake claims of voter fraud meant to distract us from the very real issues of voter suppression in the form of intimidation, poll watching, gerrymandering, and new laws enacted to limit access to the ballot for some citizens. This is the only poem I've managed to write over this difficult time. It has an epigraph from Justice Hugo Black from 1964 that reads, No right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which, as good citizens, we must live. Other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is undermined. Quotidian. Sometimes she wrote about the weather, how hot it was, or yet another lightning storm gone as quick as it came. In the catalog of her days, a dress she was sewing, car trouble, payday, laced with declarations of love to the man who would become my father. Her body bright with desire, a threshold I would soon cross into being. Two years before loving will make their love legal, my mother writes about marrying despite an unjust law. And because it is 1965, Mississippi in turmoil, she writes about a cross burned at the church next door interracial outings at the beach and being followed by police. All of it side by side in her letters, tidy script. Reading them, I can't help thinking how ordinary it seems, injustice, mundane as a trip to the store for bread. And I know this is about what has always existed 
side by side in this country. That summer, my grandmother brought the movement home. It tells the story in pictures, and it is beautiful, my mother wrote, adding, I think you know the way I am using the word. On the cover, a black protester caught in a cop's chokehold, his mouth open to shout or gasp for air. Inside, pictures I could not bear to look at as a child, a man tied to a scaffold, his body burned blacker, the scaffold still smoldering beneath him. Two boys hanged from a tree above the smiling white faces of the revelers turned back toward the camera, a young couple holding hands, ordinary as any night out on a date. Now I think of my mother in love and writing love letters, cataloging her days, those terrible, beautiful pictures on the table next to the crocheted lace doily and crystal bowl my grandmother kept for candy, butterscotch in cellophane wrappers, bright and shiny as gold. It is July 20th, 1965, two months before my parents will break the law to be married. And my mother, who's just turned 21, signs off, her rights basic as any other citizens. Have to run, she wrote, got to get downtown to register, to vote. In order to write about the present, I turn again and again to the past. And one day, in considering the long history about notions of racial difference and hierarchy, first codified by Enlightenment philosophers, I wanted to see where else I might find representation of those ideas. I pulled a book off my shelf called Panorama of the Renaissance, and there was a chapter in it called Race and the Renaissance. When I opened it, the first image I saw was a painting of a white man on a bed who had just been given a leg transplant from a black man who lay beneath him on the floor. It was one of the many miracle of the black leg images from literature and religious art, written accounts, paintings and carvings, altarpieces in several countries and across a few centuries beginning in the 12th and even a later Scottish poem, always with a black donor and a white recipient. As I walked out of my office that day, I had a lot of questions. Why did this myth of the miracle transplant emerge? How did this man come to give his leg? What can these images tell us about our current moment, about notions of superiority and its conjoined twin, the notion of inferiority, which is the bedrock of contemporary ideas about whose lives, without having to say it or assert it, matter, and whose lives are repeatedly shown to matter less rather than just as much. This is Miracle of the Black Leg. One. Always the dark body hewn asunder. Always one man is healed, his sick limb replaced, placed in the other man's grave. The white leg buried beside the corpse or attached as if it were always there. If not for the dark appendage, you might miss the story beneath this story. What remains each time the myth changes, how in one version, the doctors harvest the leg from a man four days dead in his tomb at the church of a martyr, or in another, desecrate a body fresh in the graveyard at St. Peter in chains. There was buried just today an Ethiopian. Even now, it stays with us, 
when we mean to uncover the truth, we dig, say, unearth. Two, emblematic in paint, a signifier of the body's lacuna, the black leg is at once a grafted narrative, a redacted line of text, and in this scene, a dark stocking pulled above the knee. Here, the patient is sleeping, his head at rest in his hand. Beatific, he looks as if he'll wake from a dream. On the floor beside the bed, a dead moor. Hands crossed at the groin, the swapped limb white and rotting, fused in place. And in the corner, a question, poised as if to speak the syntax of sloughing a snake's curved form. It emerges from the mouth of a boy like a tongue, slippery and rooted in the body as knowledge. For centuries, this is how the myth repeats the miracle in words or wood or paint is a record of thought. Three, see how the story changes. In one painting, the Ethiop is merely a body, featureless in a coffin so black he has no face. In another, the patient, at the top of the frame, seems to writhe in pain, the black leg grafted to his thigh. Below him, a mirror of suffering, the blackamoor, his body a fragment, arched across the doctor's lap, as if dying from his wound. If not imminence, the soul's bright anchor, blood passed from one to the other, what knowledge haunts each body, what history, what phantom ache. One man always low, in a grave or on the ground, the other up high, closer to heaven. One man always diseased, the other a body in service, plundered. Four. Both men are alive in Violdo's carving. In twinned relief, they hold the same posture, the same pained face, each man reaching to touch his left leg. The black man on the floor holds his stump. Above him, the doctor restrains the patient's arm as if to prevent him touching the dark amendment of flesh. How not to see it? The men bound one to the other, symbiotic, one man rendered expendable, the other worthy of this sacrifice. In version after version, even when the Ethiopian isn't there, the leg is a stand-in, a black modifier against the white body, a piece cut off as in the origin of the word comma, sejura in a story that's still being written. Thank you. Wow, that was um, quite an amazing reading. Um, the, the word I know that we don't have too much time, but the words diameter I heard as well, Bob. Um, rumpled I heard. Just breathe, I heard. A poem about the black leg um, will keep me up tonight. Uh, I don't even know how to talk about that. But how are we for time? Do we have a moment for a question or? Um, maybe nobody can answer that. So we have to ask the question. Um, be, because um, I spent a lot of time alone, not the best company in the world, but it was all I had. Uh, some questions about language seemed to surface. And I had a more elaborate question, but given given time, 
Um, let me just say, let me just ask this. When you guys begin to write a poem, bef before it finds its way to the page and into language, what form do your thoughts and images and narrative take? Um, is this done in language or in some other format? Is there some kind of translation that takes place between the time you're thinking about what you're going to write and the, and the time that it finds its place on the page? JC. <laughs> well, I, I believe that language is like the first form to hand for me often or to mind. And so many of my poems begin with a question that I'm able to articulate to myself or some, you know, expression of quandary or unrest. But I will say that some of the more recent poems that I, I've been writing and some of the ones that I've shared um, emerge out of um, what for me is a relatively new meditation practice. And so they're coming differently. There's an overarching uh, quandary that I would say I'm I'm kind of living in, but um, oftentimes it's an image that leads me into a poem and not necessarily a, a literal or even figurative image, but a shape, a movement um, that kind of helps me to begin in a form of description, um, carrying carrying a gesture into language and, and finding a, a rhythm or um, a vocabulary for that that can I can build upon in the poem. What about you, Bob? Well, I was partly thinking that about the before you write the poem, which is for us, every, every time we're not writing a poem, we're before the, <laughs> writing the poem. And sometimes what comes to be a poem um, has to do with the feeling. Sometimes it has to be an image. Sometimes it has to do with a question, uh, a thought. But for me, at least, if there isn't something like a musical phrase in language, I, I, can't, get, I can't get started. It really does begin with, not so much with language, but with the music of language for me to get anywhere. But what, what, you know, with, with art and music and eating and olfaction, the senses experience it. But, mm -hmm. but how does that, uh, I mean, you don't need language for that. You, you just, you, you know, one of the senses picks it up and interprets it for you. But when you're thinking about writing a poem, what is the nature of that moment before it finds language is what I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Is Natasha dis disabled? Does she get to? I think she might be reconnecting. I saw that message on the screen a, a moment ago. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard for me to, to separate these, these elements from one another in some ways. Um, I feel like I am often driven to write because of something found or felt in language in words um like that the poem the elephant poem that i read that l began from an encounter with a text that put my you know allowed something that was preoccupying me to enter into dialogue with this other this other source and i think it's often like that for me um there's a preoccupation or a concern that finds a way to collide with either rhythmic language or another um another layer of senses. Um, for me, it's often a visual sense that I, that I turn to when an idea kind of gives way. I'll see what I can see and what that can reveal to me about, about the next thing to trust in the, in the process of writing the poem. Um, but I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to gather something. And so I, I feel that like I'm, I'm turning to any scrap of meaning or encouragement um, that can be useful to me in um, moving through what is usually a, a feeling of unrest. Even in the poems that I've written that feel like they are happy, there's the desire to get to um, 
get to the other side of that feeling. And so that that feels to me like a form of unrest. And the poem, the, the process of building the poem is about um, trying to unearth or uncover um, as much as I can in in the different vocabularies that I that I have or that the poem can offer me. What, what I loved about the elephant poem was the negative space that you allowed us to participate in so that we could fill in the language of what was not there. Mm -hmm. And you, you lead us to the edge each time of the cliff and we need to fill in quickly before we go over the cliff. Do you guys um, dream in language? <laughs> I have some funny memories of dreams when um, I was working on my memoir and really trying to um, get in touch with all of the, you know, memories that I carry of life with my mother. I was having a lot of dreams that were, you know, in some of them I felt that I was encountering her from, from you know, the, the position of adulthood. And I remember one dream that I keep hoping will become meaningful, <laughs> where I was talking to her. And I was saying, how am I supposed to find meaning and clarity? And, and is there something God, you know, wants me to understand? And her, her answer was, you have to read the book of Taco. <laughs> and um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that was truly a message from the other side or not. I have not yet discovered what that is, but that that dream in language kind of stays stays with me. Dan, what about you? I think I sometimes there is sometimes language in my dream, sometimes not. I I I think I've never been able to figure that question out. I think my dreams are kind of like movies. And I think having grown up with movies must tremendously have affected the way we dream. Because my dreams are intensely visual. What about you? Well, I mean, there's certainly moments where language is kind of a major player, where a phrase will play itself out. And it may even be so strong as you wake up and, and write it down, mm -hmm. because you think it's one of the great phrases that you've ever come up with, which turns out in 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 daylight to be um, either kind of unintelligible, yeah, or just really a poor piece of prose, yeah. But I want to think for a minute, since Natasha is not with us, I want to think a little bit about her her poems and the way that I feel that so much of of the work of history and of archival attention is about calling our attention to what, what is there, what has always been there, oftentimes in language um, that we haven't yet fully enough seen, uh, heard for, you know, for what it really is. Um, and so I love the way that that attention, it's not necessarily about inventing or finding the language that's missing, but saying, why, why is it that we have um, avoided the reality of you know, what these words tell us. Like, I love that there was sin in the beginning of um, Cincinnati, um, Miss in Mississippi, and just thinking about how um, so much of what, what we need to contend with is actually there. We just need to turn our attention and our courage toward it. Well, as, as a kind of catalyst, I mean, Cincinnati, uh, Mississippi, um, but I don't know, it haunts me to try to figure out what happens between the moment where you have an idea or thought and you speak it. Does that get created in language or is there some kind of translation that occurs between whatever that format is and the time it gets expressed in words so that the other person can understand it? This may be too Virgo-esque. <laughs> uh, for me, it absolutely has to be created too. You know? What did you say, Bob? To me, it absolutely has to do with hearing the tune. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I need, a, I need a phrase that generates the next phrase, whatever thoughts I have. Uh, 
Okay, well, I think we, we've um, gotten to the end of the language part of it. Uh, so, Dan, I wanted to say it's amazing, 50 years of, of uh, the National Poetry Series. Or how many volumes have gotten published in that series? Well, we'll be at 200 and something. We're honoring it today, and honor, and it's lovely that we're. I remember very well uh, the getting in my hand Sterling Brown's *The Road* and Michael Harper's collected version. It was really a revelation at that time, and uh, a, a wonderful activity for everybody here for National Poetry Month. If you haven't read that amazing book uh, of that by that remarkable man. Uh, that would be a good way to celebrate this month. Huh? Completely. I'm, I'm sorry. Right, to come, uh, Southern uh, Road and the poem Memphis Blues. Memphis, yes. So I just want to say, wow. Okay, wow. This has been so beautiful, so amazing. I'm sorry that we lost Natasha. Oh, but I think um, she had a shaky internet. So um, I just want to say, you know, what Tracy was saying at the start, you know, how hard is it to keep going? It has been so hard, but things like this, conversations like this one, presentations like this one, shaky or not, aesthetic, notwithstanding because it goes everywhere and all all over the place but it's so creative and it's what we have and we have used it and i just hope that i'm going to get to see all of you in person soon in miami and i want to thank you because for books and books poetry means so much not just this month but like year round and the National Poetry Series is brilliant. So I hope that everyone that's watching will take it upon themselves to look into the poetry series. If you don't, if you're not already familiar with it, perhaps donate to them so that they can keep doing this wonderful work that they do. Um, this is food for my soul, but it's food for, I think, everyone who is watching. Um, that miracle of the black leg, I agree. Natasha, you're not here, but I'll be thinking about that for a very long time. And thinking about how all of your, all of your voices connect to each other as well. And just grateful for the opportunity on behalf of Books and Books, on behalf of Miami Book Fair, I thank you for your time, for your work, for your devotion. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks all of you for, for being here and the poets. Yes. It was a wonderful night. Thanks and good night. Thank good you. night, everybody. Thank you.